The American Dream Many people come to America from all across the world to chase their dreams, and Professor Selwyn Kajo is a prime example of this. He hails from the small island of Trinidad and Tobago and landed in New York City. While in the Big Apple, he worked his way through school as a busboy and cab driver to eventually becoming a world-renowned professor in African American Studies. He is one of the pioneers of African American Studies being taught on the college level in the United States. He is currently a professor of African American Studies at Wellesley College in Wellesley, Massachusetts. He is taught at Harvard, Cornell, and Fordham University. He is the author of several books, many of them focusing on the history of Trinidad and Tobago. He is also the founder of NEAP, which is essentially the NAACP of Trinidad and Tobago. He has written for the New York Times, Boston Globe, and travels the world giving keynote speeches, educating people on the impact African Americans have on the American culture, among other things. Great one, two, G. Okay. Struggles of success, struggles, struggles of success. Struggle. You gotta work hard if you wanna be the best. best. Struggles of success, struggles, struggles of success. Struggle. You doing something right if you different from the rest. Different struggles of success, struggles, struggles of success. Struggle. Your will and grip will get put to the test. Fact. Struggles of success, struggles, struggles of success. Struggle. You were put here for greatness and nothing less. Straight. Straight. Struggle. Necessary for success If you learn from your struggle Your life no mess Have faith in yourself You are the best you are. A struggle is really just a life test Be Welcome to Struggles of Success And today You guys have a special, special guest This guy right here is A paragon As I like to say Professor Speaker person that fights for this community, a person that really, really makes a difference and gives back, none other than the only Selwyn Kajo. Let's give it up to Selwyn Kajo, guys. <laughs> Professor Kajo, how are you doing today? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for a wonderful introduction. It's my pleasure. So, pretty much on the note, the struggle for success, where you tell people how you made it to where you are now. I and mean, we know you came from humble beginnings, you're from Trinidad and Tobago, right? Yes, sir. So, what was it like growing up in Trinidad and Tobago? Let the people know. Well, it was a great childhood. Uh, we did what all of the children did. We played a lot of soccer, cricket, pit stops, marbles, and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I grew up in a small village called Tagarigua. And Tagarigua is an Amerindian word. Because a lot of uh, the people who, the Indians, Amerindians, who came to Trinidad initially, came from South America. And sometimes they brought their names with them. So in our village, it was named after the Amerindians. A lot of Amerindians lived there years and years and years ago. When I grew up there, there was a very large black population. There were three villages. St. Mary's Village, which was black, and that's sort of like in the center. And then you had the Indians, that uh, the Indians who came from India, who lived in El Dorado and Paradise. They were surrounding districts. But primarily, our uh, lives were lives of African people. We did things like, you know, give thanks to the dead, have Thanksgiving services, clean the dead, the graveyards, light candles. And so the whole life we had, my mother took part in something called Susu. And Susu was an African, of course, tradition where we pooled monies together and so on. So I had a very traditional African life in that village, almost a repetition of the kind of life you may have had in an African village. Okay, okay. So pretty much, you know, growing up in Trinidad, it was very similar to how people would have grown up in Africa, I and that kind of sh shaped you to who you are today. I, I think so. A lot of my values were, were taken from the... In fact, I was telling you that over the weekend, that's around last weekend, this is Columbus, was, Columbus Day weekend was last yes. weekend, I went to see my eldest cousin, and that's the eldest Kajo alive. She's 82 years old. Her name is Mislet. Myself, my sister Margaret, 
my cousins Rhonda and Marva. We all said we hadn't seen her for quite a while. We really wanted to see her because again, we don't believe that when somebody dies, you run and cry and all that stuff, that you see them and do for them while they are alive. So we hadn't seen her for a while. So we called her from Trinidad. We found a number from another cousin. Mm -hmm. That's Junior, that's Marva's brother. Okay. Um, the Swansons, another cousin. And we decided to go see her this weekend. Now what was very interest, interesting about that Sina is that she's sort of, well, she walks and so on, but she's 82. Mm -hmm. And she wants to take us to, we took her to the grocery store. But she wanted to go also go to a West Indian store mm -hmm. to buy some fish. Mm -hmm. She said, why the fish? And she said, I never told anybody this that our grandmother, our grandmother, whom she grew up with, every year around September, October, would prepare food for the dead, for the ancestors. Mm -hmm. She would cook a saltless piece of fish, mm -hmm. put it in a plate with dal, with rice, provisions. It was a sacrifice she was offering mm -hmm. the gods. And then put a glass of water and a glass of white wine mm -hmm. And then she'll call upon the ancestors mm -hmm. to bless everybody, all members, calling them by their names. So may God bless say, Papa, my, my father, Laio, Dada, or Uncle Hamil, or Mama. So one, one thing we get from you is that one of the values that you were raised with is to really appreciate the dead and the elders. What other values did your mother, who you grew up with, instill in you to make you the man you are today? Well, ancestors are very important, uh, and that tells us about our lives, you know, that in terms that Africans value, see life as, yeah, as a big chain, as it were. The unborn, the living, and the dead who are the ancestors. So that sense of Africanness and being proud of yourself for who you are. Because you must remember when I was growing up, and not so much so, but certainly when I got to the States, that there was not much appreciation for black people. But you know, they thought we were inferior. Africa was the dark continent. So that love of Africa and things Africa just became more manifest when I got here. Incidentally, uh, my grandmother, uh, she took part of something called Shango, which is Shango is the god of thunder in the Yoruba religion. And uh, there was this feast every year. And she cooked the meats for the feast. She cooked the unsalted meats again. So this African past one of the things that I still remember. Uh, in terms of values being uh, instilled within me. Uh, the second value was your word was your bond. My mm. mother would say your word was your bond. Once you give your word, mm. you must keep your word. Mm. You must keep your words. If I promise you, I'll come and take you to New York or I'll give you whatever, your word is your bond. And that word is your bond, bond was very important because, I mean, I said she ran a susu. What mm -hmm. a susu was is that in Jamaica they call it partners. Mm -hmm. And everybody bring their money once. Like you have 20 people in a susu market. I think it's your sister, your mother still does it. Mm -hmm. You have 20 people and every month, every week, somebody bring a $20, $20, mm -hmm. and you keep the money. It's sort of like a, a savings fund a savings. within the community. Organized within, within by the, the family, yes, within yes. Family. But okay. that's African. That's an African tradition. Oh, it's an African tradition. It's an African tradition. Okay, got it. I'm saying got in Jamaica. It. To make it, they call it partners. Okay. Uh, the same. So that's so your word. I mean, you can only do it if people believe it. You can't take them and run someplace because right. hey, where, where you gonna go anyhow? Exactly. Exactly. It's a small village. Everybody know where you are. But your word was your bond. Mm -hmm. The second value. The third value was honesty. Mm -hmm. The third value was honesty. That you had to be honest in whatever in thought, word, and deed. That's the same in the church, but that's. Honesty is a very important value, and those are some of the uh, some of the, the qualities that uh, that were very important for us. Uh, honesty, your bond is your word, and so those okay. are some of the qualities that are. I'm to, yeah. I think those are some very very important qualities that mm -hmm. everybody should have today. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that you came to the states. What was that process like? I'm sure it was probably scary. You're coming from a, a small island. You have your certain way of living, and you're just in this this big crazy place. Mm -hmm. What was that like? How how did you transition up here? Did you always have a goal to get up here? Like how did that work? I never really had a goal to get up here. Um, 
the, I look in Tagarigua, and we, we always admired the States. So, wanted to come to the States. It was there. It was, there was an overwhelming desire. But remember, our family, certainly on our, our mother's side, even though we have an aunt who left for the States on my father's side about 1920 or so, and came to live in Harlem. She would send back barrels. I knew nothing about that. I knew she would send back barrels. Mm. But on my mother's side, we had always been coming to the States. Mm. Uh, in fact, um, my grandfather on my mother's side died in the States. Mm. He died in the States. But then there were my, uh, my mother's aunts, like Aunt Laura, had lots and lots of kids. And they moved to the States in 1949. Before that, others moved. But the way it went, they would move and they would send for someone. Okay. So first, one person would come to the States first and then say, I said, I'm good here, now you can come. Get a home. and give, They give them a start. That's how okay. all immigrants live. Okay. And so, I wasn't supposed to come. And of course, it's usually the eldest. Okay. So, Magadis, that's Ruby's mother. That's on my mother's side. Magadis is mommy's younger sister. Mm -hmm. Her son. Dalton had come up here. Okay. And he worked in a boat and he jumped he, he jumped ship mm. when he got up here. Wow. And then there's Clyde. And then Clyde sent for Winston, not for me. Because mm. Winston was the, the oldest. Right. Uh, but he didn't want to go. He didn't mm. want to come. He was playing his card and gambling and all that stuff. He loved that life. He wasn't gonna come no place. Okay. And since he wasn't gonna come, it's okay, but you could come. Uh, so pretty much, your older brother was supposed to be the one that came to the States first, but he didn't want to. That's right. So you took the opportunity to come to the States. That's right. That's so, right. So what was it like here? Like, what was your living arrangements? What was your career? How old were you? What were you doing up here to survive? Like, what was that like? Well, that was kind of tough. Because, of course, you knew, I mean, it's not like today. Today you have television. And emails and so on. Those days you had no television, no email. Well, what, what year was it when you came up here? 1964. 64, okay. About August, about the 16th around, I guess around that time, the middle of August I came up here because that was our school vacation. Okay. I was teaching in Trinidad <clears throat> and I left, but I wasn't sure. Well, I, know, I knew, one thing I knew, I wanted to work and go to school. That I knew. Okay. How that was to be accomplished, I don't know. I had no sense, I could have no conception mm -hmm. of what New York was, or what New York like, or what was on. Mm -hmm. But I came, I came around the middle of August, mm -hmm. and then I was here for about a week or two, but I wanted to go to college. Mm -hmm. So wait, let me just clarify something. So when you were in Tech Rig, were you already in your career teaching? I was teaching, it was what's called a pupil teacher. Okay. We have a system in Trinidad where once you leave high school, as it were, or a little, you know, primary school, I would say, and you kind of go to high school, it's a system where you could teach in classes as a junior teacher, as a preparatory teacher, and you go up the line to become a teacher. Okay. So gotcha. I, I became that, through that route, I became a teacher. Okay, gotcha. And so I was teaching. But unlike here, in, in the States, you have to have a degree to teach. Mm. They didn't have to have a degree to teach. Mm. Of course, I guess it was a black, a third, a third world country, so that that wasn't so. At any rate, I was teaching, and I was determined to do a degree, go to school, because that's what next day, one of the myths, it wasn't quite a myth, but one of the, the, the myths, that you could do anything you wanted to do in New York, mm -hmm. you could start from the bottom and go to the top, the Horatio Alger myth, you start poor, you can get rich. Oh, the, the good old American dream, as the, they call it. The good old Dream. Right, right. So I came here, I had a hundred bucks in my pocket. A mm -hmm. hundred dollars in my pocket. And of course you've got to go up and down and so on. But I want to go to college, mm -hmm. maybe St. John's in New York or Fort whoever, whoever will have me. Mm -hmm. But as I applied and they said I couldn't be accepted in the college mm. because I didn't have a high school, I didn't have a college degree. I didn't have science, I didn't have American history. Okay. So they said you had to go and have, get those two subjects and then you could come back and reapply. Okay. So I got here in 64. At the end of, at the end of, well, I thought I got it in the middle of August. 
at the end of August, I applied to something called um, Barrowall Academy. I don't think it's, I think it's probably still there. Barrowall Academy is down Fulton Street. You go down on Smith Street, mm -hmm. downtown by the Board of Education, the street before that is Smith Street. Mm -hmm. Something called Borough Hall Academy where they offer classes. Mm -hmm. And so I joined the classes. Mm -hmm. I paid to join and I did uh, the classes. But to get, they say, well, how did I get the money? Because it must have been about $700. I didn't mm -hmm. have the money. Right, right. So I had $100. Right, right. It's important. So, and I, my elder cousin didn't want me to go to school. That's Clyde. Mm -hmm. He wanted to go and do soldering. Mm -hmm. You know, soldering. I don't really know. Let's explain that to, for me and the people. So the ring is when I, you know, when you do it on ships, you use that thing and you, you, it's a metal thing which you join metal stuff and so on. You solder it. Kind of like welding maybe? Welding. Probably it's welding. You okay. probably call it welding. Okay. And I said, I didn't come here to go welding. He said, yeah, right. I could, because I could make money. Right, right. So I, 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 I didn't leave home. <laughs> I didn't leave Trinidad to come up here and be a welder. But then remember, he's the elder cousin. Ah. Oh. You can be rude to your elder cousin. So okay. I thought I was being rude to him. But I said, I'm not going on. Is that right? And so then I got a job where I could work in the day. Mm -hmm. where I could do my go to school in the day and work at nights. It was really a job at a restaurant. But how I got the money, he didn't lend me the money. His wife did. Mm -hmm. Okay. His wife loaned me the money and said, okay, pay me back. She says, he's too stingy. He's too cheap. Nice. So she loaned me and I paid her back. I'm, I'm sure he probably charmed his wife and to lend you that money, not well, on you. I, I hadn't met, I mean, I, only, I knew her from home uh -huh. because they'd stayed at home. Okay. When you say home, you mean Trinidad, right? In at, at our house in Tagarigua. Okay. Because our house is the world. We, Miami, we're probably the only one who really owned a house. Our house is like a house of refuge. Okay. Anything happened, everybody came to our house. Okay. And he had been seeing this woman, mm -hmm. got her pregnant with his baby. Uh -huh. And... They had to leave the yard they lived in because he's, he was living with somebody's wife. Right, right. So they had to come to us to live. So they had lived with us ah. for a number. Before he came to the States, he had lived with us. Okay. In fact, he had three kids, Arlene and, no, Darlene or Arlene and Anne and something else. And they lived in the house. They lived in the house. Oh, okay. I don't know where they are now. Right, right. But they live in the house. But she, so I knew her. That's okay, right. gotcha, gotcha. And so she loaned me the money, paid her back. Mm -hmm. But then the real hard part was, now of course, remember you don't know anybody, mm -hmm. you know you know the city. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand this, uh, first of all, I didn't understand how these houses were all joined together. Mm -hmm. Those row houses, everything is in New York, Brooklyn, everything is joined together. Right, like right. Like the wrong stones and all that stuff. Right. Because everybody has a standalone house. It's like where you're from. Yes, okay. I don't understand that. Uh -huh. But one, so the first time here, I walked along one block and I come back home. Next day I walked down two blocks, uh -huh. just to get a feel of the city. Right? right, right. So then I had to now go to school. The fare is um, 15 cents for a token. Okay. Was well, this the bus, train? You could use everything, because the bus and the train. Okay, the train, the token okay. was 15 cents. Okay. And I got a job uh, as a dish, uh, a dishwasher, I think, yes. Well, kind of the restaurant, anyhow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was the easiest one to get. Mm -hmm. Because remember, of course, I was an, uh, I didn't have. You didn't have your work. papers yet. I couldn't work, so. Right. So how'd you get that job? Do you know somebody? Or oh no, no, you used to walk in? No, 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 no. There used to be agencies in Manhattan. Uh huh. Where you go to an agency and you pay a fee, mm -hmm. and they send you to a job. Okay. Okay. I don't know if it still exists. They go down and they send you the job because in any part of the Bronx, you know, when you go and you start to work. Mm -hmm. Now I was making, I think. I guess no more than about 50 bucks, maybe less than that. But remember, you have to send money home to your mother, you just have five bucks. Mm -hmm. You gotta pay your tuition, mm -hmm. you gotta pay transportation, mm -hmm. you gotta get books, all of that. Wow. But the thing about it, so, and you have to pay your fees. So I couldn't buy anything. So each day for my, because when you work at a restaurant, you can have everything to eat but steak. Okay, okay. So you got the you got the free food. The free food. Oh, nice, in the nice. day I eat nothing. The day I eat, it's about a chock full of nuts. I don't still is there. I have a cup of coffee and a donut. That's all I have. Mm. I get up at eight, go to classes, I have a, a, a donut and a cup of coffee. And that's mm. it for the day. But when I went to the restaurant, uh -huh. my boys were there. They know because in the kitchen you could see all the white folks in the front, but in the kitchen. Usually black people. Okay. The cooks are usually black. Okay. The dishwashers are black. 
the bus boys would be white college kids. Okay. But the black guys are looking out for you. Right, right. So they were very proud that I was going on to college. Oh. So what they would do, when I got there, pay my eggs, my bacon, my juice, so I had. Nice. That was my dinner. So nice. they looked out for me. And that's the kind of game how black folks look out for one another. They were looking out for me. So it's very, very tough. I know I had to work. Uh, no, in a restaurant, you must work on the weekends. Okay. Because the weekends the big really? time for them. You, you can, uh -huh. If you work and you can't come the weekends, they don't want you. Okay. Because their business is on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They're big. If you can't work, they don't need you. Right. So I work, then I get probably a day off or two days off during the week. Uh -huh. And I could do my studies. Mm. But when I go back at night, I had to come home and do my studies. So when I was working in a restaurant, I'd go from, I would get up at 8 o'clock in the morning, take my bus, go down to school, leave at about 2, come home, change my clothes, and jump on the train and get to work about 4 o'clock, work from 4 to, eight, 4 to 1, I think. It was 8 hours, yeah, 4 to 1. And then those days I had lots of snow, lots mm -hmm. and lots of snow. And I would, uh, you know, and of course, when you work at a restaurant, in the kitchen, you got to clean out the whole kitchen before you leave. Right. So the, the crew that's coming the next day has a clean kitchen. Mm -hmm. And you come home, of course, then you had no car, so you had to wait for the bus. Mm -hmm. It's cold like hell. So what time did you get off about? You say you... You, work, you say you woke up at 8 o'clock, went to class, and the work started, what, about 6? No, to work? Yeah. 4. 4? Yeah, 4. I said you worked from 4 to what? 4 to 1. I 4 think. to 1 in the morning? Yeah, 4 is wow. 8 hours. 4 and yeah, 4 to, yeah, 4 to, 4 to, 4 to 12 is 8 hours. They okay. one hour off. So about wow. 4 to, it'd be about 1 o'clock. They come here to study. Wow. For like 2 hours, so then you're going to bed till 3 o'clock. Wow. And you get the next morning, you're gone again. Mm -hmm. Sunday got so tired, you're taking a shower, you fall asleep in the damn shower, in the mm -hmm. bath, or something like that. So it was very, very tough. I mean, uh, it was so cold, I had no money. So I remember, so winter came, I got here in August. Winter came, I was wearing a Terrellin shirt, and the breeze began to blow, and I began to feel so cold. Mm -hmm. And I went to a Salvation Army joint mm -hmm. and bought a coat, a winter coat for $5. Nice. And that took me through about five winters. Mm -hmm. That took me through about five winters. Okay. So that's how tough it was. So, but you had to keep on, and I kept on going, you know. So, but it was very, very tough. It was very, very tough. At some point, that's when I went on to college. Now. So wait. So what? What kept you going? You know, what was it that? That's a pretty difficult schedule. You know, wake up eight o'clock. All you have is a donut and a coffee to hold you over till four o'clock. Then you work from four to one. Then you come home and study for two hours. What kept you going? You know what? I mean, I'm sure there was times you're like, oh, I can't study, oh, yeah. I want to quit. Yeah. You know, what was that motivating factor that kept you going? It's something I really can't describe. It's just that you want to make it. I mean, the goal then, of course, first of all, you can't go back home. Mm -hmm. You're proud of your mother, mother to be proud of you. And you left in the 20, you got a lot of energy. 20, 21, you got energy. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you know, you just push. The thing you want to, I guess you want to achieve, you want to get a degree, you want to, you know, want to better yourself mm -hmm. and so that is what kept you going because somehow you know if you do this thing right there will be better days ahead but I mean yes sometimes I said I almost joined the army I joined the, I joined the army when things got so rough the mm -hmm. army the, the, that's what I had to, at that time was the Vietnam War I almost joined the Vietnam War you know mm -hmm. but it turned out because of my legs so the so how, how close were you to joining it turned out because of my leg Oh, so you already went through the whole application process? I don't know the trust. I go and they were asking me about the thing, and I probably told them about my leg, and they, I couldn't uh -huh. go because of that. Okay. Like, sure, if my leg was good, I probably have gone. Because it was really rough. I mean, you, you go on day in. I mean, you had no day off, you know. Mm -hmm. You go to school five days a week, and on the weekends, you go to, you go to the, um, you go to the, um, the weekends, you go to um, the restaurant. The restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so that if the two days during the week you got, you probably had to study. Mm -hmm. And I guess on those days off, I remember I sleep all day. Mm. I sleep, because I was tired. Right, of course, as you should <laughs> be, as you should be. <laughs> so it was really rough, but I just I like, wanted to do it, you know, and mm. um, met new friends and so on and so forth. So what was like your first, I guess, success, your first small win where you saw like, you know what, I actually could be a teacher in the States. When was that for you? No, I don't know, no small wins, I suspect. Um, I don't know, I think it wasn't some, some small wins, it was simply survival, the survival mechanisms. I mean, I, 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 of course, then I, when things began to change, of course, I said the first week I went, I went the, the, uh, my first year, I went to whatever school I called, 
And then um, the next year, I got into St. John's. Okay, so you, you actually f completed the American history. I completed the American history, but the interesting thing about that was a very funny thing. In Trinidad, we did not have semesters or okay. credits. Okay. When you get to St. John's, you take your GCs, either pass or fail. There was no credits. Right. Here, you have a credit system. Mm -hmm. So when I went to this, this uh, whatever, Bar Hall Academy, mm -hmm. And I, I was getting A's and all that kind of 90s and all these little white boys who were getting uh, 70 were supposed to graduate. So I don't understand how they, I'm doing better than them. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to graduate and I kind of graduate. Right. I don't understand that at all. I had no notion of this credit stuff. Uh -huh. So, I mean, the one thing my mother always told me, said some of the lessons, to stand up for yourself. Okay. Speak your mind. If you believe in something, you speak your mind. That's mm -hmm. the, back from honesty and your word. Another value. Say, the value stand up speak your mind that's why your mother is the way she is speak okay. your mind mm -hmm. and so after a month or so two i went to the i went to the principal of the school i said i don't understand this stuff mm -hmm. i'm doing better than all these guys and they're going to graduate why can't i graduate mm -hmm. because i got to the three or four year program right and he said to me if you think you're so smart why didn't do the gd okay i didn't know you what the gd is i didn't know what that was Ah, okay. We went down, I said, fine, and I said, went to Stevens Institute in Hoboken, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I think it's not he, he, uh, um, Stevens, uh, probably Institute or Student University. Mm -hmm. But we went there, I took the path mm -hmm. out of New Jersey, out of our 34th Street, and went to Hoboken, New Jersey, and did the GCs. Mm -hmm. And I got 90% that I was over nine in everything I did. Nice. Nice. It's over 90, meaning you're better than 90% of the people who did it. Nice. So when I went to apply to St. John's, Again, they can understand. I had, a, I had GCs, a General Certificate of Education from London. I done this course at London University. Mm -hmm. I had taught at past Trinidad, Trinidad exams and so on. Mm -hmm. So when I went to St. John's to talk with the dean, now again, I didn't know what discriminate racism was. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't scared of going to talk to any dean. Well, the dean was the dean, so mm -hmm. I went to talk with him. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. If you could get more than, if you get go to do the GD and you get 90, more than 90% of it, admit you. And I said, boom, I've got it. Uh, <laughs> I, I whipped it out. Know. You already had it. Oh my God, I whipped uh, it out. Okay. And so they had to accept me. Okay, okay. And that's why they. So St. John's right here in Queens, right? No, there, Queens was the, the, there was a branch of St. John's in Brooklyn. Okay, okay. Along again by Livingston Square, right down by the Board of Education across the street. There was a Brooklyn branch. I went to the Brooklyn branch. Okay, okay. But Queens was this other like headquarters. Oh, okay, gotcha. So I went to gotcha. the Brooklyn branch. And then uh, after being a year at St. John's. What did you study there? I did, uh, I did okay. I was doing, uh, I guess I was doing economics, I suspect. Okay. I doing economics. And then after a year, the, the priest up at St. John's here struck in 1966, I think was the first time that they were, the, the priest had ever struck. What do you mean by struck? The strike, they stopped teaching. Oh, okay, better, okay, okay. okay. Better wages or whatever. But okay, struck. okay, okay, they went on strike. They went on strike. Okay. But it was unusual because they were a priest. Right, right, they right. priests at the school. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know, but all I know, they said that if they did strike and so on, they would lose the accreditation. Mm. No, I didn't know what accreditation meant. All I know that if, I, if they struck and so on, my degree wouldn't be good. Mm. So I applied for a transfer to Fordham. Mm. Smart man. So I went down to Fordham. Well, Fordham at that time <laughs> was located in Manhattan, near to the near to the, the mayor's office, mm -hmm. about two blocks. I would suspect about east. It's not where the J J Jacob Javis Center is. Okay. And Fordham sold that property and went to Lincoln Center where they are now. You know, Lincoln Center where the school, the, the law school is Lincoln Center for them. Right, right. And I spent, and so I went to went to the school of education, uh -huh. which was at uh, which was at um, in close to the close to in New York now. This was uh, Brooklyn. I moved to Manhattan, mm -hmm. close to the mayor's office, and then the solar. I went to Lincoln Center. So I spent my last year or so, or two years at Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. for them. So throughout going to Fordham and St. John's, we still a dishwasher, and you had the that, that no, same. No, no. Well, that time, well, I, 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 by that time, but well, two things that happened at that time. One is that when I got to working for Fordham, I began to work at the Murray Midland Bank. So I was no longer a dishwasher. Okay, you're a bank teller. I wasn't a bank teller. No, they had jobs for um, at that time. 
when you cash a check, now you check, I guess it's automatic, but when you check cash a check, be it Chase Manhattan, uh, whatever the bank was, mm -hmm. the banks that you go up the bank, you go upstairs, you cash a check, the thing, but downstairs, the other thing where you have to clear those checks to okay. see if, it, if, if you have enough funds. Okay. So you had some big, before the, the computer came in, you had some big mainframe computers. Okay. And we had to process the checks downstairs hmm. from all of the different banks. Hmm. And at, 12, at about 10 o'clock, there was a flight going to Chicago. It had to be sent out to Chicago where your checks were, cat, where were cleared. I got a job working down there at the at Marine Midland, right on Wall Street. Oh, wow. Then Wall Street was a new bank. Okay. But again, the funny thing about that, I did not, I didn't change, I, I, I give them my name because we had to do it with the bond. Uh -huh. They didn't check this, that, that carefully, carefully that time. Oh, uh, so you, you, were, you weren't supposed to get a job because you weren't a citizen yet. Yes. But you got a job anyway because they didn't do the due diligence. They didn't do the due diligence. Okay, okay. Uh, and then I got married around my junior year. My junior year, my last year school, I got married. And then I became a PUM, PUM resident, so. Oh, so you, you found an American to give you the citizenship? No, I got married. And then, of course, once you were married, you're eligible to get a green card. Ah, okay, so, okay. But I got a green card. I didn't want to become a citizen. I got my green card in about... 1968. Okay, okay. That's when I got a job. I got, I got a fellowship, a presidential fellowship. Mm. And then I went to Cornell. Uh, I got another fellowship. After you taught at Fordham? No, I didn't teach at Fordham. I, uh, yeah, I know. That's what happened. I, um, after I graduated from Fordham, I became a counselor. Okay. And a recruiter for Fordham. In other words. Uh, I, okay. um, I, um, but first of all, I got a presidential scholarship at Fordham. What was the president? The president used gave scholarships to the best students. Okay. I got a presidential scholarship to allow me to do my masters. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So while I'm doing my masters, I also became a counselor. Okay. And I recruited for the school, so I go to different places like Boys High in Brooklyn, uh -huh. and different schools, and okay. recruit students for um, for for Fordham. Uh, for Fordham. Okay. And just about that night, I'm talking about 1969. Just around that time, the whole big movement for black studies broke out. Okay. People are demanding to teach courses that are relevant to black people because you remember mm -hmm. you have King is killed in 68. Uh, Martin okay. Luther King is killed in 68. Malcolm is killed in 65. 68, there are big riots in the city. It's only folks left here to go out of the suburbs. Uh -huh. And so they, they've been demanding now that they teach us about our own heritage. Okay. And since I had gotten, I remember, to like a presidential scholarship, uh -huh. and I was doing my master's. That would be 69, I graduate. And between 69 and 70, uh, I hadn't even done Afro-American studies literature, but they, I began to teach Afro-American studies. I began to teach black literature at Fordham. So, so I got my job, my first job as an instructor. So hold on, just to clarify. So you went from recruiting students for Fordham. That was part of it, yes. And then they just gave a position to teach African American literature. You never taught because taught because that there was there was a great demand for it. The oh, students so said the, the demand the demand was so high, and, and you, you had the opportunity. And I had done you had done it on your own, but I had not done a formal course on it. Okay. So in 1970, I was in I was employed as an instructor at Fordham. Teach, at Fordham. Nice teach Afro American studies. Nice. And then I so I'm, so I'm now I'm teaching Afro American studies. Mm -hmm. I'm also doing my masters. Okay. All at the same time. Okay. But remember, I told you that my mother taught me always to stand up for what you believe is right. right. So what had happened at Fordham? I began a book for a program called H E O P. I think it was there. Higher Education Opportunities Grant. Okay. Where the the state had a program where they'll give monies. We make a we apply for it to 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 not only recruit black students and Hispanic students, but to give to, for the upkeep for the food and whatever. Mm -hmm. And we got a big grant, but it was something called a line budget. And a line budget, you're not supposed if you give you money for food, you can't transfer it to drinks. Right, right. Or you can't try it for clothes or to right. books. And Fordham began to do that, and I stood and said it was wrong. We shouldn't be doing that. So what happened? They fired me. Oh, you told them it was wrong that they were doing that and they got rid of you? Yeah. Because you spoke your mind? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You were a man of integrity? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. And then, even though my, my department 
I recommended that my contract be renewed. Mm -hmm. The school did not do it. So how do you feel right there? That must be a blow. You know, you and your masters, you have a nice little job, and it's then. It's a blow, but at that time, you know, that's a lot. That's a very high period in your life. You have black power, you're doing a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's the world is open up. You know, you know, you move on. So you just, you just got, you got back up. They knocked you down. You got right back up. I didn't get knocked. Well, I get knocked down, but I had to make some choices. Okay. There wasn't, you know, I didn't. I wasn't renewed at Fordham. But there were so many jobs around because I remember now I taught two years. Oh, you got the experience already. There are a few people now with masters and so on. Oh, so you finished your masters before? I'm not finishing my masters. I finished my masters. Yeah, I finished my masters about seventy one, I would think. Okay. Seventy one or seventy two. Okay. But the big trick here now is where sometimes the decisions that you make change your life. Okay. Now, they have not renewed my contract. Mm -hmm. And the reason they gave, I had not shown what they called proximate plans for the, com the completion of my table degree. In other words, I wasn't in a PhD program. Uh, because to be a professor, you ideally ought to have a PhD. Okay. Not all professors, but now I guess so, but then you had a little bit of their masters and they were professors. Okay. And so I had to make a choice, which is, of course, is the best choice I ever made. Is that I could go and look for a job. I could have gotten a job at City University. Any other place, mm. but I would simply have had a master's. Mm -hmm. But I made the determination since I wanted to teach, I knew I had to get a PhD. Okay. So the choice was do I go ahead and do my PhD, which means I would not be getting a salary, mm -hmm. I'd be going back as a PhD student, or I could work at City College, sometimes get a, be, remain a professor, right. or an instructor getting a full salary. Okay, that's a big choice right there. It's a big choice. It's a big choice. And I'm married at this time. Mm -hmm. I'm married at this time. So I said, you know, if I'm going, I'm going to take the shot. I really thought, again, this is where you asked me what kept you going. I really felt I could have done my page in one year or two years. I okay. really felt that. Okay. So I got into Columbia. No, at that time, no, I don't know what an Ivy League school is or nothing. I'm from Trinidad. Mm -hmm. All I know is a university. I don't know anything about Ivy League and Fordham and Harvard and Yale. I didn't know what those things meant at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, the guy who recruited me from Harvard, Corner talk of the Green Machine. I that's the name of the football team. I know what a green machine was. Right, right. So anyhow, I had to make a choice. And then, of course, no, having made the choice to go to university, I have, I applied, I had three choices, I think. Boston University, to do my PhD. Okay. Boston University, mm -hmm. Cornell, mm -hmm. and Howard. Okay, so this is for your PhD, you can get PhD. it in, in African American studies? No, just no, no, there was no such thing, this wasn't being offered the time, I had to get it in English. Oh, in English, okay. Because I did my undergraduate degree in English. Okay. In English, so. so now I have the choice, I have to now decide. Now remember, I told you, I don't know anything about Ivy League schools, I don't mm -hmm. know anything about American higher education. Mm -hmm. So I got these three schools and I have to make a choice. There's a white guy called Dan Sullivan. He was a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And he was very kind to me. Because first of when I got kicked out of Fordham, he got me back in. But he treated me as a man, you know. He says, okay. you messed up, don't do it again, I'll get you back in. Okay. But he had done a thing that had given me confidence in him. While I was at Fordham, I was an undergraduate, he got me two scholarships. Mm. Not much money now, but then it was a lot of money. I said $250. Right, right, right. To buy books and so on. That mm -hmm. was big. I mean, no, that shit, is big. That is big. Nothing, that is so big. So he treated me well, so I had confidence in him. Okay. So I went to him and I said, Dr. Sullivan, you know, I need your help. I've been, I've been accepted at three schools. I told him the schools, Howard, Boston, and Cornell, what should I do? And he said to me, if you select, if you go to Cornell, you'll never regret it. Okay. And I went to Cornell, I've never regretted it. Nice. Right. So now I have to go out to upstate New York and I go corner to do my PhD. Okay, so do you finish it in the one or two years like planned? No, no, you couldn't. There's no way. There's something to do a PhD, something called a residency requirement. Okay. And that residence, that residency requirement means you must be on school on the campus for two years. Okay, okay. So one year is out of the question. Okay. So being it's that... It's three years. Three years? Not bad. So being that... You're married. I'm not sure if you have kids yet at this time. I got one daughter. Francis was born in 1970. So you have one daughter. Yeah. <clears throat> you have a PhD. With where are you? What's your living situation like? I don't have a PhD yet. I got the PhD. Oh, you're, 75. you're pursuing your PhD. Pursuing a PhD. And you still need money. So are you working still? They give me. Oh, I was again. Yes, I uh, I had a what's called a junk. I thought I I was all a hustler. 
Uh -huh. I taught it, um, I, I mean, as a John, they gave you a small stipend, uh -huh. but I also taught a course at Ithaca College. So okay. I bring me some extra money. So while you were pursuing your PhD, you were an adjunct professor at Cornell. No, I was an adjunct professor at Ithaca College. Oh, so you did both of them. Okay, so I'm doing I'm doing my PhD at Cornell. I'm right, a student, right. a PhD candidate okay, okay. at Cornell. Okay. But I'm doing an adjunct. At Ithaca because I taught before. Ah, uh, okay, nice. <clears throat> so you're getting your your professor experience up. Well, I mean that's a job. I mean it's such a job. You know, you don't want to get experience. You just want a job because you don't have enough money, and that helps you fill the hole. Okay, okay. So you get pursuing your PhD and your adjunct professor. Yeah. All right. And you graduated in what seventy. 75. 75? Mm -hmm. Okay, so after that, you jumped right into being a full-time professor or was Yeah, it... well then of course now I have a PhD, uh -huh. so I could be a professor. But I mean the different stages. The first stage is an assistant professor. Okay. But funny enough, <laughs> again, when I got my PhD, I had three choices again. Mm -hmm. One was, again, Howard. Mm -hmm. Howard offered me an assistant professorship, mm -hmm. I think making about 12 five. Mm -hmm. Ohio University offered me an associate with a higher rank, mm -hmm. making sixteen thousand, mm -hmm. and a place called um, Oh God, Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo in Michigan offered me a higher, more twenty-one thousand. Mm -hmm. But my dilemma there is, I want to teach at a black school. Mm -hmm. I want to teach at a black school. That they offered me first the lowest rank assistant, uh -huh. the least amount of money. Mm -hmm. But I want to teach at a black school because I come out. I want to teach black kids. I don't want to teach white kids, and mm -hmm. so on. So when I went to the chairman of the English department at Howard, he says to me, that's the best I could do. Because I said, well, listen, I've got these big offers. Make it 135. That's only a thousand more. Yeah, but I could live up. Because I really remember my guy that I want to teach at Howard. Right, right, right. Kalamazoo, Athens, Ohio, all the white right, guys. Right, right, right. They right. make it 135. Because I had a friend and she said to me, get your best salary. Okay. Because at Howard, they don't raise your salary very often. Uh, so okay. make the best deal. Okay. And make, I said, give me 35, make me an associate. Mm -hmm. He said, that's all we got. If you don't like it, you can leave. I said, okay. Wow. I left. Wow. Because I knew that, that with that attitude, it wasn't going to be a place. Right. And I went to Athens, Ohio for 16000 mm -hmm. And I told the yeah, but I hated it. I hated There's no black people, no black women. Mm -hmm. No black church, mm -hmm. no black nothing. I was the loneliest. Can you taught there for a year? Yeah. So like you left your whole family in New York and... By that time my wife and I, I think we were sort of separated, I suspect. Okay, okay. I think by that time we were separated. Okay. And because we got divorced in 19... When I was in college, college, as a matter of fact, at, at 1974. I thought I got married in 75, so in uh -huh. 74 we had divorced. Mm. That must have been tough, you know, pursuing a PhD and then you have all the yeah. actual personal... Oh yeah, I like a whole lot and I have a daughter and all that kind of shit, but hey, you know, you gotta, gotta keep life it going. is tough, you know, you gotta make choices and keep on going. Right, right, right. Because sometimes you make a bad move and I think, I mean, it's funny, you make a bad move at that time and it messes your whole life up. Exactly. You wouldn't exactly. see it then, but when you look back, you know. So I went to, I went to, I went to, I went, I went to Athens and mm -hmm. I spent a year, but I hated it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that's where I got involved with the African National Congress in South Africa and all those revolution groups down there. Mm -hmm. And I got, I got involved in Marxism, did some work, followed the Communist Party in America, and so on. That's my first year. Mm -hmm. That's how we fighting for liberation of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And then I was, no, oh, I can't take it down there, man. It was lonely. Mm -hmm. And then, again, jobs were, I, did, I applied for a job at... Uh, Albany, in New York, Harvard, mm -hmm. I said, and I got in Harvard. Okay. So that was it. I said, shoot, you get in Harvard. I'm going to Harvard. So, nice. So after one year, that's in 76, mm -hmm. 76, I got into Harvard. I got an assistant. No, if only I had to take a demotion to go to Harvard mm -hmm. from an associate to an assistant. Mm -hmm. I didn't mind it. I right, just, right. I just, I just went to Harvard. I wanted to go to Harvard. Right. That's right. School. Yeah, you can't be Harvard. Man. Everybody knows about Harvard. Yeah, really so I went to Harvard and that was it. And that's how I got my, then I began to work at Harvard. That was a great place to work, you know. How many years were you at Harvard? Five years. Five years, okay. Five years. And did you get any promotions in those five years? Or? No, that's not how Harvard works. Harvard gives you, uh, gives a junior professor a five-year contract, then you got to go leave and make your way in a world and they, they would invite you back. Oh, wow. 
So I left, but at that time, I didn't want to, I, I didn't think about teaching, I want to go and get involved for, in politics and so on. Okay. So at the end of that time, I went back to Trinidad. I spent a year at Cornell and I went back to Trinidad for like five or six years. Oh, really? So after you taught at Harvard, you went back to Trinidad? Yeah. And did you, you taught there? Or Never got a job. You couldn't get a job at Trinidad? No. With all this experience you have in, no. the, in the city of big dreams, you couldn't get a job back in your home country? Because I said it was too radical. Uh, it was just too radical. Never got a job in Trinidad. Wow. I mean, I did how I, you said how I live. Well, I did what you did. I began to do interviews. I began to interview um, Angela Davis, Carl Sagan, and so on, and package it and send it to with a show on television. Oh. And then, of course, in the summers, I would teach at Cornell. Cornell was like me. I was a good I, was, I liked my home. Okay. Cornell was like me. So even though I stopped teaching at Cornell, because I went there and taught for a year, probably six months before I went back to Trinidad, but uh -huh. I had a summer job. Uh -huh. So every summer I got to Cornell and teach. Okay, okay. And, and then after, well, after I couldn't get a job in Trinidad for four or five, for five years. So you, during those four or five years, you just did interviews with people who... Uh, they have celebrities, like what they like. I did something on Bob Marley, but I, wouldn't, I did something on Bob Marley because Bob was died. Uh -huh. I did Carl Sagan as a great astrophysicist or whatever he was. Uh -huh. The planetary scientist is what he is. Okay. I interviewed uh, Angela Davis, she had done a lot of revolutionary stuff. Uh -huh. And other people. Okay, okay. I uh, sent it to Trinidad, we had some other uh, something called Time to Talk uh -huh. on TTT. I had a lot of those programs now. Uh -huh. And uh, I did, for example, this guy who was the, from Eritrea, not Eritrea, from Namibia, the president of myself and County had gone down and done that. We interviewed him at the United Nations. Mm. Uh, because that, all the time, all those countries are fighting for independence. Right, right. So that's part of that. That's the 80s. Okay. Yeah. All right, so boom, you're training that for five years, mm -hmm. and you say, you know what, I want to go back to teaching. I didn't say that. What happened is that uh, I'm in Trinidad, I'm trying to make a life in Trinidad. I think my family, we get back together, they come down for a year, mm -hmm. my sister and my mother. And I'm working among the Indian people, organizing them and so on. And then in 19, what happened? Oh, my brother got sick. Eddie Winston got sick in 1984. Uh, 85, 84 or 85? 84. Yeah, 85 because Francis was born in 85. Mm -hmm. He died in November, but like a, year, a month or so before he died, he held my hand, my ex wife hands, and says, Man, you know, you're a good man. You want to help your people, but you can't live off your mother. Mm -hmm. So you better get a job. Mm. It's okay. And that's what led me to get a job. And I got back at job market here. Mm. I got a job at Leslie. And that's where you are today? But I was very lucky. Yeah, that's what I did. I was very lucky. Because I was when, my, when I would be in my 40s, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be close to 40. You know, it's difficult when you get older, people give you a job. But I had taught at Harvard. Mm -hmm. I had taught at Cornell. Mm -hmm. And so it was easier. I had a track record as Right, there. right, right. So I got a job at Cornell. Not, I think that the job I got was just a part-time, a replacement job. It was mm -hmm. not a full-time job. Mm -hmm. So I got a job replacing someone for a year. Mm -hmm. And myself and BJ, that's when we came back onto the market. Mm -hmm. BJ went to Oberlin, I went to Wellesley. Because mm -hmm. we were both at Harvard, we were both at Cornell together. Okay. BJ and I were at Cornell together. Mm -hmm. that's, I think we were at visit and whatever. So that's where we got to know each other. And um, went up to Cornell, and the person whose job I took, she went to Iowa, mm -hmm. and she got tenure, a big job there, so she quit. Mm -hmm. And I applied for it, and I got the job at Wellesley. Nice. And that, what was that teacher, English? No, Afro-American Studies. But by okay. that time, Afro-American Studies was a big established field. Okay. I started in 70, but by 85, mm, okay. it's a big established field. Okay, okay. And that's where you are today in Wellesley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teaching African American studies. Uh, from American literature, uh, from American history, a little bit of it, but that's it. It's that was, Arabian history. That was quite the journey you took. Oh, and, yeah. And yeah. through a lot of difficulties and oppositions and ups and downs. To oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You got settled down. Out, teaching. You, you got kicked out, you got divorced, you got to run from one part to another, oh. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it was a rough one. I want you to touch a little bit about NIA. I feel like that's something that's very big for Trinidad and Tobago. That well, not NIA was that, uh, what happened, NIA? There were no. Still is now. Any black organization representing black people in Trinidad. Mm. So, so it's kind of like an NAACP yes, in yes, Trinidad. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And, uh, we and you found, founded it? We found, yes. Okay. 
And we saw a need for that. It was it started very big. We're doing very good. Lots of recruits and so on. We're there for 10 years on that. Uh -huh. But gift scholarship, I think you could went to one of the scholarships to different people. Mm -hmm. Bring down big speakers down there. Do all that kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. But what happened? We didn't get the support. We didn't get the support that we needed. Mm -hmm. So after about 10, 12 years, I mean, I couldn't carry on dual lives, living here, working down there. So it became a bit tough. Mm -hmm. So we had to get it. But it was very success successful while it was taking part. Okay. While it was going on, it was very successful. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And you're also an author. How many books have you written? <laughs> Too many books. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I wrote about it. I, I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, don't. Well, give, me, give, give the people a rough estimate of how many books you've written. <laughs> about 10 books, 10, about 10 12. Books. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I know it must be a tough process. What's, what's it like writing a book? You know, how long does it take? You know, I know it could be very difficult. I know there's a lot of research. There are different types of books. There are books like you edit books. That's when you put things together. That's why when I said how many books I write, it's a kind of difficult stuff. Because the books you just sort of, they join the books you sort of edit. Mm -hmm. You put together works by other people and keep some of your works in it. That's mm -hmm. like sort of solely authored. Mm -hmm. You have joint orders, you work with someone else. Mm -hmm. But when you've got to do your own project, like the major books of them, like say, well, six, five or six books just like by myself, sort of. I mean, these are academic books. These are not the regular books. There are other books like I wrote on Indian time or communists. Those are, you know, Movement of the People, Eric Williams, Sela James, those are sort of slight books, but they are. But they're sort of solely ordered books, which you're talking about. Uh, some books take as much as 10 years, 8 oh, years. Wow. The last book I just finished uh, took about uh, 7 years. Oh, wow. Because remember what you're doing, and that's why I got to run back up and <laughs> isolate myself for the next 2 or 3 months because they want this book in January. Mm -hmm. Is that you don't, it's, it's something you know nothing about. I mean, this is the last guy I wrote a fellow called William Burnley was a slave, slave owner. We have no books on him. Mm. And I just got interested in him because we lived on his plantation. Mm. We owned Orange Grove Sugar Estates and we worked on that plantation. Mm. I got interested in him because when I grew up I saw you see his big mansion in the savannah. Mm. So when I started off I knew nothing about him. Mm -hmm. So you gotta start to go and dig mm -hmm. to get it. In this case a lot of work is at the British the British the British uh, the British archives. In London, in Kew. Mm -hmm. So you really got to go through and go through the documents, the colonial document. Each day is like you're going to work. Mm -hmm. You get up, take a shower. I stayed in, in central London and I uh, would have to get up at 7, 7.30, take a shower by 8 on the train because it, it lip opens at 9.30. Mm -hmm. uh, you stay there all day from 9.30 where they got a cafeteria there. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to go in the job. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you do this like during your sabbatical or something like that? Or? Well, I do it in the summers, during oh, January, summers. and when okay. I get a sabbatical, I do it, yeah. Okay. And you go every day. In fact, I had a sabbatical at the University of London, and I think that the, 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 uh, in spring of 1913, 2013. They figure they end like quickly, but they don't end because you got to go and you don't know what you'll find. Right, right, right. You can find a whole new thing that opens up a whole new door. Exactly the case. Okay. And then you probably you know, you have to go there and you got to go to Trinidad Archives because there are records in Trinidad Archives. Right. So you go to London and you go, as I had, he had some connections in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So you got to go up in Scotland look at mm -hmm. that too. Uh, and that kind of stuff. So you did a very thorough job researching this guy. Well, because what happens, I mean, yeah, I mean, it has to be a thorough job because it's not just for you, you know, it's, it's open when I say. For people. Open, yeah, and anybody could check what you say. Right, 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 right. So it's not like, so that's when you become an authority in the field because when you say it, nobody has to say anything else. Right, right, right. Unless right. they go find out the information. Okay. But it has to be thorough, that's the major point. It has to be thorough, uh -huh. has to be well written, uh -huh. it has to be documented, you have to have support for what you're saying, right. and it must make sense. Gotcha. And after when you're finished, you didn't have to have it submitted to a press, okay. a university press. They may agree or don't agree. They may say, yeah, like right now, I submitted to a press. They have one, two, two turned it down. Mm -hmm. One press turned it down. I think Carolina press. Two press turned it down. Mm -hmm. A third press accepted it. Mm -hmm. But then you had to write or do a summary of the reader. They have to different readers. Mm -hmm. You don't know who the readers are. And right. they make comments about it. Mm -hmm. Strong points. And then you have to put that together. 
and now at the point I've read a synopsis and now we're trying to get out for next year. Okay. But I've got to get it into them by uh, January, so it means I just got to get up as I do now. Mm -hmm. Get up at 6 in the morning, mm -hmm. go to my office, get up at 6.37 sometimes and work all day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're, you're still working, still working hard, still hustling. But it's not hustling, it's not work. I mean, when you begin to like something, it's no longer work. I mean, mm -hmm. it's work, yes, but you enjoy it. So it's not a work I mean, you're looking for because you want I like. I think that should be said again. I think that's a very important comment. What's when that? you like something, it no longer becomes oh, work. Oh, it's not a job. You just got to, I mean, you see me read and reading last night. I mean, uh, that's a book I'm reading. Uh, I mean, I have to use it for my, my new book because mm -hmm. I might have some new information. Mm -hmm. So apart from the research, you have to be also reading other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Apart from the literally going to the archives, mm -hmm. you're gonna be reading other stuff to clarify other points. Right, 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 right. So it's a continuous mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. But like I said, you enjoy them, and I'm excited mm -hmm. to get the see the book on market. Mm -hmm. It's like taking a little baby and growing that baby, and you see the baby come to a man. Right, right, right. You know, it's a sort of it's it's, it's a it's a really an organic process. Mm -hmm. It's not a sort of static. Just look in the book and so on. But again, it goes to, again, it depends on what you like. Right. I like doing that. That's, right, right. I like going to, uh, somebody once called me a sort of literary detective. Mm. A detective, you go and look for stuff and right, find right, culprits. Right, right. And so like you got, got a little adventure you're going on right there. And of course, it has national implications and Caribbean implications because this guy who I'm working on was the biggest non-resident slaveholder in the Caribbean. The mm. biggest level in the, the British Caribbean. The whole British Caribbean or just Trinidad? I said the British Caribbean. Oh, wow, okay. okay. I didn't know that when I started. Okay. All I knew was that guy, he had a big house in Savannah. That's where I started. Mm. That's all I knew. Mm. And I knew that my grandfather, my great-grandfather, was born and was born like to work on the plantation. Mm. That's all I knew. Mm. But I knew it was from that village. I knew he lived on the plantation. I knew my, grand, my grandfather worked on the estate. I know my uncles work on the estate. I know my brothers work on the, my brother work on the estate. I did a little something else. So that itself uh, sent me on a chase. I wanted to know. The literary detective. Yeah. So, Someone called me so let me ask you a question. I ask this to all my people I interview. So a paragon is a model of excellence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What would you say that you're a paragon in? A literary theory, but more Caribbean stuff. More Trinidad stuff. Caribbean and Trinidad stuff. Literary theory, history, culture. I like those things. Okay, okay, perfect. And as we experienced throughout this interview, you had a very difficult journey. What kind of advice would you have for people that have big goals and dreams and it may seem distant in their future? You know, you grew up in Trinidad and you're a big time professor, speaker, author in the States. What kind of advice would you have to, to keep people going, to keep that hope alive? Find your passion and go after it. Mm. Yeah. Find your passion and go after it. It's not always easy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you fail. Sometimes you can't even see ahead. Mm -hmm. If it's what you like, you keep trying it and keep on doing it. So I gotta ask a piggy follow-up question to that. A lot of people say find your passion, but what age did you find your passion? I, I you discuss, it's not like an age you find your passion. I mean, uh -huh. it doesn't quite work that way. I don't think that's the right way to put it. Okay. Is that you're doing things. When I started, I wanted to be a doctor. I messed that up. Okay. I wanted to be an economist to mess that up. Okay. And I sort of fell into literature. Uh, I always liked to teach because I started teaching and my father taught. So I liked teaching and I got into the teaching business. I think I like more ideas. Right. So that always intrigued me. That always intrigued me. Okay. Well, Professor Kajo, it was definitely a pleasure. And we hope to, we wish you good luck on the book, release of your book. And thank you very much. Hey, it's been my pleasure talking with you. I told you before your continuing tradition because when I was your age, probably a little older, I interviewed my uncles mm -hmm. for a documentary mm -hmm. I was doing on Tagarigua. Mm -hmm. It was shown on TDT, Trinidad Bigo Television, and mm -hmm. I still have that documentary. Mm -hmm. They're all now dead, but we have all the life shots, so you're doing a good job. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Yes, it's your fate to be great. It's your boy, Great One 2G. And what's this logo, you ask? It's a logo of greatness. The logo that represents Paragon. Now, what's a Paragon? A person or thing viewed as a model of excellence. For example, William Shakespeare is a Paragon 
of literature. Me? Great with Suji? I'm not going front. I'm not there yet. But when it's all said and done, I'm going to be a paragon of greatness. When they're thinking about great people in the year 3G, from the year 2G, they're going to think about your boy. Great. Alright? So go out there and cop some Paragon products at great12g.com because you are a Paragon of something. And remember, it's your fate to be great. Struggles of success, you were put here for great. Great one, two, G. Okay. Struggles of success. Struggles of success. You gotta work hard if you wanna be the best. Struggles of success. Struggles of success. You doing something right if you different from the rest. Struggles of success. Struggles of success. Your will and grit will get put to the test. Struggles of success. Struggles of success. You were put here for greatness and nothing less. Struggle. Necessary for success And if you learn from your level Your life no mess Have faith in yourself You are the best A struggle is really just a life test Be a student Study the universe You were put here for success Destined from birth You were the lucky sperm You were the lucky egg Definitely not a germ The real noble leg Struggle from the start Had to be free The creation of you was destiny A pregnancy For you to be born That is all struggle You are not the norm Truly unique Listen when I speak Struggle necessary, learn the lesson that it teach I don't mean to preach, your dreams in your reach Millennial motivation, call this my speech Struggles of success, struggles of success You gotta work hard if you wanna be the best Struggles of success, struggles of success You doing something right if you different from the rest Struggles of success, struggles of success Your will and grit will get put to the test Struggles of success, struggles of success You were put here for greatness and nothing less See, any really special only one of you, even if you're a twin, differences just a few. Yeah, there may be two. You may have different crews, and you have different struggles, depending how you crew. Let's talk about the Jews and what they went through. The Holocaust was crazy, but they didn't pursue. Now they have all the bread and like they far ahead. But just 80 years ago, they were almost dead. See, anything is possible, you just can't quit. Look what Rosa Parks did, cause she wanted to sit. You gotta have courage and a lot of it But courage ain't nothing if you don't got grit Get, get, get gritty Stay, stay, stay persistent Take over your city Go, go the distance Struggles of success, struggles of success You gotta work hard if you wanna be the best Struggles of success, struggles of success You doing something right if you different from the rest Struggles of success, struggles of success Your will and grit will get put to the test Struggles of success, struggles of success You were put here for greatness and nothing left Great!